it's interesting that Nick picked out of that that song. So he doesn't know what I'm going to preach on, and I don't know what songs he's going to prepare for a Sunday morning. But it's interesting that the the song that spoke to Nick the most this morning was that one about um, trials and testing, and that's kind of what I'm preaching about this morning is is times of testing. And if you've been around any length of time, no doubt you would have faced a time of testing and a time of trial. Um, And that song, Every Blessing You Pour Out, is an incredible song, and it's an incredible hymn in the church, and it's a beautiful hymn. But there's a line in there that is very difficult to accept for most of us, and that's that you give and take away. You give and take away. Speaking of how God gives and God takes away. Now, it's a line out of the book of Job. And if you've read the book of Job, you'll know that Job goes through incredible times of testing. But if you've been a believer for a while, and maybe, maybe you're new, and maybe someone has said to you, listen, become a Christian and everything's going to be fine. It'll be amazing. Life's going to be so good. They were half right, but there is still times of testing that come. Jesus says to the disciples, when you face troubles in this world, he gives them advice. He doesn't say if, he says when. And so we all face times of testing and times of trial. Some of those are self-imposed, like when you choose to do a marathon or something like that, and you feel this time of testing that you've put yourself under. Some of them are because of our silly decisions that we make. We put ourselves in a place where we have times of testing and times of trial and times of trouble. But if we look through the biblical record, we see over and over again God testing people and putting people through trials. And it's, it's actually necessary for God to put us through a trial if He's going to use us. If He's going to If he's going to do something great with our lives, God has to test us. Not so that he can see what's in us, but so that we can learn. God's got a, I believe that God's got an incredible plan and a purpose for each and every person that's sitting here this morning. I believe that God has a a desire and a dream over your life that is far greater than you know. I think we think too little of what God has for us so often. He's had a plan and a purpose for you from the day you were born. In fact, He knew you even before you were born, the Bible says. There's a beautiful quote from Pete Scazzaro, and I'm going to quote him a few, uh, some of what comes out of today is is from him. Um, He's a pastor, he leads a church in New York, but many of you wouldn't have heard of him. He's not like a fancy oak, but he's, he says this, he says, you have a unique manifestation of God through your unrepeatable life. You have a unique manifestation of God through your unrepeatable life. How beautiful is that? You are uniquely made in the image of God to represent God here on earth, to be His kingdom representative here on earth. You have that unique representation of God that none of the other 8 billion estimated, over 8 billion people in the world have. You are unique. Your life, your life is unrepeatable. I thought that was such a cool concept for me, that there is nothing that is, there's no one that is going to repeat what God has got for you. Your calling is to bring God's dream to bear for you on this earth while you're alive and to offer it back to Him as a gift. And it's great to think about these amazing things that God has. It's great to think about these incredible promises that God has spoken us. And coming out of the Identity Series, it's easy to get caught up in how amazing we are because God says, you are loved, you are cherished, you are my child, you're adopted, you are blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And that's amazing. But we, when we face trials, what happens then? You know, a lot of the prosperity gospel says, name it, claim it, and frame it. Like, you've got to declare your thing, and you've got to claim it, and to speak it into being. But what happens when those things don't come into being? Friends, we've got to widen our theology and our understanding of God to embrace some suffering, to embrace a theology of testing and trials. Most of us signed up for a comfort of ease and and joy. We didn't always sign up for the difficulty and the lots of pain. We want abundance. We want stillness. We want the sweet and quiet waters and the easy pastures. And we usually interpret when things are going bad that things are going wrong. When we, we see troubles and times of testing, because we're so hardwired for comfort, we find testing and trials to be a problem, and we think that there's stuff going wrong. But if we understand testing, when those times of trials and testing come, we're not going to miss God in those moments. Now, I don't want to, again, not every 
form of suffering is from God. Please don't hear what I'm not saying. He is a good father. Some of it is because of sin. Some of it is because of our own stupidity. But testing is also a part of the way that God works. Right from the trees in the garden, it was a real test for Adam and Eve. There were actual things like don't do this and do that. And they walked past that tree every day. It wasn't like it was fenced off and hard to get into. It was a test. It was a, it was a daily occurrence of will you choose me? Will you choose to obey God? Will you choose to obey the Father? Abraham, God tests Abraham, Genesis 22, with giving up Isaac. The Israelites in the wilderness, God tested them by giving them manna daily. God's provision to them daily was a test, Exodus 16, 4. It's an incredible thing to think that how come God gives them manna? We, we, we look now, we look back, and we go, man, that's incredible. God's supplying it, but they had to trust God for only that day. That's the test. Don't collect more than what you need for today. What an incredible test. Deuteronomy 8 verse 2 says, Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and to test you in order to know what was in your heart. 40 years of wandering in the desert was a test for the Israelites. Jesus is tested by Satan in the wilderness, led by the Spirit into this wilderness where the wild beasts were. And there the enemy comes and tests him. Now, Jesus is the beloved son. He's just heard that at his baptism. He's secure in his identity. He wrote the identity series that we went through. I'm kidding. It was a person who wrote it, but he kind of gave us the background to the identity series, and that's where we get it from. And God speaks that identity to Christ. He's full of faith. He's obedient. All of the things that we want to be, and yet he is tested in the wilderness. The temptations for Jesus and for us as well is always to avoid suffering. The enemy comes, and he doesn't, he doesn't want to bring new things to Jesus. He doesn't try and get Jesus to, to do something different. He says, hey, that thing that you're trying to achieve, everybody to come and worship you, I'll give you that, just short circuit. See, the enemy knows what's coming, and he tries to get Christ to short circuit what God's plans are for him by avoiding the testing and the trials. And he still does the same thing with us. We avoid testing and trials and we don't walk into the fullness of what God has because we seek comfort rather than the promise. The enemy offers Jesus opportunities of wealth, of power, of having worship without the testing and the trials. He doesn't have to trust and obey God. He can have it now. So often we fall into the temptation of those same traps. Have it now. You'll be okay. Just avoid it. In his book, The Making of a Leader, Bobby Clinton speaks about tests. So what he did is he wrote this book and he, he went back and studied through the biblical record and through church history how God makes leaders. What does God do? How does God take leaders in the Bible through various t trials and tests? And he came up with um, a whole lot of tests, and I've got some of them here, and some of these are from Pete Scazzaro as well. But he talks about different kinds of testing, and I, wanted to, I, wanted, I want you to think about if you can relate, if you've been through some of these testings. And so, so these are them from, from Bobby Clinton. He says, the first one is integrity testing. Daniel 1, Daniel 3, Daniel 6 are good examples of that, where, where Daniel, is, you know, Daniel and his friends are taken off to... Um, Babylon, and they're put up before this thing, and it's like, hey, just bow the knee to this God, and then you can carry on doing what you like. Just, to, just take this shortcut, avoid the trial and the testing, and then you'll be fine. You'll have all the nice things, and their integrity is tested. And all of them pass that the incredible story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire. Like, how does that work? I don't know. The fire set them free. It was supposed to kill them, but it burned the things off their hands. And so there's a fourth person in the fire with them there. It's an incredible story of how when they pass the integrity, they go through the trial and the testing by fire, and they come out of that. Or obedience testing. Abraham sacrificing Isaac. You know, an obedience test is often God asking you to do something that makes no sense. It's easy to be obedient with things that are like, yes, I can see how this is going to play out. If I, don't, you know, if I don't drink too much and I don't beat my wife, I'm going to stay happy and married for a long time. Like, I get that. That's logical. Some of us still struggle with the behavior, but we get it. 
like it's logical. But how about when God says, that promise that I've given you, I want you to lay that thing down. Abraham to Isaac. And Abraham goes, all right, Lord, I don't know how you're going to do it, but I guess you're going to raise him up from the ashes. And he's willing to sacrifice the very promise, the very thing that God has said, this is what I want you to have. Are you able in the obedience testing to go through the times of trial and temptation? Or the authority test, being under an authority that you're tempted to rebel against. Maybe you're, maybe you're under a boss or you're being led by someone who you feel is less competent than you. Maybe you, you, you're in a place where you're like, man, I know more than this guy. Like, I'm, I'm better than this. Like, why do you have me here, Lord? I have been through that myself. I worked in a business and I was, it wasn't so much an authority with the person, but it was a, an authority with the position I was in. I was fixing roofs and I'm like, I have two postgraduate qualifications and here I am in a roof looking for leaks on a 38 degree summer's day in Rustenburg, getting sunburnt on my back because my shirt pulled up when I was painting. Like, this is what I'm doing with my life, Lord. What have you got me here doing? And the temptation is to shortcut what God is doing and to get out of that testing and that trial. But it, what, what it was for me was that it was an incredible moment to see that sometimes God puts authority in our lives to test us, not in a way that we need to learn anything about who God is, but in a way that we need to learn to be faithful under that authority. You know, when Jesus comes to a centurion, or a centurion comes to Jesus, and he says, Lord, my servant needs to be healed. And Jesus says, okay, I'll heal. I'm, uh, I'm paraphrasing. He says, okay, I'll heal your servant. He says, the guy, I'll come. And the guy says to him, the centurion says, no, no, you don't even need to come. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. I understand authority. I'm a man under authority and I have those who are under me. And when I say go, they go. And Jesus says, never. And so Jesus speaks, servant healed. And he says, never before have I seen faith like this. What an incredible moment. The man who understands authority and Jesus identifies it as faith. Are you able to work under the authority that you've got in your life through faith in God? Does your faith work out in being obedient to authority, even authority that you think is not right and like, I know better? The authority test is a difficult one. Well, how about a conflict test, test of conflict? And not just like rubbing up against each other, but serious conflicts, difficult conflicts that come into our lives. Or the betrayal testing. Every, if you've led anything for any length of time, you would have been betrayed at some stage. You would have felt that moment of like, Jeepers, that's a betrayal of me. It's a difficult thing as, as so, when you lead in some way, and even if you, sometimes in parenting, when you've got kids and you're like, man, you just, like, that's a betrayal of everything I've sown into you. For those of you with little kids, God bless you, it's coming. <laughs> They're amazing now because they love you and you're, you're incredible. And you are. But there's a moment coming where you're going to go through that testing and you feel like you're betrayed. But what do you do with that? How do you face that, that tempting? How do we respond? Are we, are we loving it and uh, are we loving our enemies? And I'm not talking about your kids anymore, but <laughs> others that betray us. Are we, are we able to love our enemies in that way? Or are we going to absorb the betrayal and become bitter and cold? Are we going to face the tempting and the, the testing and the trial and become softer and more loving and more forgiving? Or are we going to become more cynical and resentful. How about the backlash test? When you ask someone to do something and, and it's perfectly reasonable and you think, man, this is a good idea and they just backlash against that thing. There's a complete rebellion against maybe your leading. Moses and Nehemiah both went through those things. Or the losses and sufferings test. Many, many, many of you have been through major losses in your lives. But some people live with unimaginable losses. I mean, can you think of people that live in like a war zone? Of the losses that they are facing. The difficulties that they are having. That's a test. Or what about the test of possessions and money? There's a difficult one. Are you faithful? How do you make choices based on living lives of wealth? It's a test both having it and not having it. How about the test of making mistakes? When others see your mistakes and don't let you forget about them. Are you able to own them? Are you able to move on? Are you able to keep leading others? Or what about the dark night tests? St. John of the Cross wrote a book called The Dark Night of the Soul. 
And he spoke about how when we walk with Jesus and our, our faith, we eventually at some stage and probably repeatedly go through these times of dark nights of the soul where we feel like God has left us and God has abandoned us. In a marathon, they call it hitting the wall. It's when you run for long enough that you eventually get to the end of your energy. Magretta hasn't discovered that yet. She still needs to run further. She just, she just keeps running and keeps going. She's incredible. But um, I hit the wall often when I run. And uh, it's, it's a moment there where you've got to decide in that testing and in that trial, what are you going to do? How are you going to face that? You know, Mother Teresa wrote in her journal, she was an incredible woman who served God faithfully for many, many years. In the poor, she served the poorest of the poor. And I mean, she had, she had mangled feet and she walked every day. She had mangled feet because she would be the last to choose from the shoes that were donated to her organization. And they often didn't fit her very well. She would give them to the other, other nuns and give them to the people who needed that were serving them, that the people that they were serving. But you know that she wrote in her journal that for nearly 50 years, she felt dry and like God was not present with her. 50, five zero. Mother Teresa, we all looking at her going, man, this woman is saint. Like you want to, that's a real, like we know from the identity series, we're all saints, but how do you keep walking? How do you, that's a testing and a trial. Keep serving, keep faithfully being obedient to what God has spoken to. And yet she feels dry. Because it doesn't feel like the, the water of the Spirit is pouring out in her life. feels like God is not there, not speaking to her. That is an incredible testing and trial. I think part of that test, part of her testimony is because she went through that testing and trial. And she was able to continually be faithfully obedient without having the angels carry her out of bed in the morning and make her coffee. She just got up and faithfully served, facing the testing of the dark night. And then lastly, the, other, the last one I had was the testing of shattered dreams. What do we do when the thing you were working for, when the thing you were longing for, when the thing you were hoping for goes wrong? The house you wanted to buy, the car you eventually owned, and then the bank repossessed it, and then the business you wanted to start, and it doesn't work. The child you wanted to have doesn't come. The marriage that you thought was going to be the happily ever after ends and is broken. What do we do in those times of testing, in those times of trial? They're difficult moments. How do we maintain our faith in God in those moments? See, testings, if we don't, if we don't get them right, God is so loving and so kind and so faithful to bring those testings around to us again. He gives us second and third and fourth chances to learn and on and on to go through those testings and trials because it's good for us. Testings are God's great gift for you and to you. He gives them to you for you. It's his best way of maturing you and growing you into something and to someone who he's made you to be. Some of the testings we face, friends, are answers to our prayers. One of the most dangerous prayers you can pray, pray is, Lord, give me patience. Because God gives you things in your life that will increase your ability to be patient. It's not really the most dangerous prayer. There's other prayers that are more dangerous. But you get what I'm going at. Some of them are answers to our prayers. And we're going, Lord, make me, a, I, I want to be a leader. I want to be a leader. I want to, I want my own business. And he puts you under, he gives you a job. And you're like, this is super frustrating, Lord. Like this person is an idiot. They're making so many mistakes. And God's going, just this is a time of testing and trial. I'll give you your own business, but this is a time of testing and trial. We go through things and, and we think sometimes we get, we get so distracted by the, the testing and the, the, the trial that we miss the lesson. And we miss the moment that God has there for us. And we just think, man, God has left me alone and I'm not here. And maybe I've done something wrong and that's why I'm here. But God's going, would you learn? Would you see? Would you grow? Would you learn from that moment? This is my gift to you. This is an opportunity for you. And so whatever trials and testings you're facing now, I want to encourage you that there are rich treasures in your testing. Maybe it's testings of your health. There are rich treasures in your testing. You will enter into life like never before if you will embrace your testing. Perhaps there are, are deaths that need to happen inside of us. I was, 
I felt God's call to preach and to teach early on when I was saved. It was about six months after I was saved. God spoke to me. I've shared the testimony before. And it was 10, a little over 10 years before I got to preach my first sermon in a church. It was an incredible like, time of testing and trial for me. And it was literally two months, not even, about six weeks before that moment that I had said to God, obviously I heard wrong. I have wasted 10 years of my life preparing for this because like it's been double figures now. It's a long time, Lord. Maybe I heard wrong. I'm just going to pursue something else. And I was digging a hole at a factory, having finished degrees and all sorts of stuff. And I'm putting up a signboard at a factory, frustrated with God and sweating. And just like it's not nice ground like it is here. It's hard, high felt ground. There's rocks and devil and all sorts of things in those holes. And digging. And I got the phone call from the guy who was leading our church. And he said, hey, do you have a sermon? We'd love to give you an opportunity. And I'm like, in that moment, of t- I had laid that thing down six weeks before and said, right, that's enough, Lord. I'm not going to study anymore. I'm not going to. Sometimes there's a death that needs to happen in us to something and of something in the testing and the trial. But there is new life that God will bring in you that will surpass what has come before. The other thing that we get through testing and trial is revelation. Is an understanding of God's word and of who God is, better than ever before. That comes very often in no other way. All the biblical greats are tested right throughout their lives. Not like one test, you've made it, whoo, you're the man, you're the man of power for the hour, you can lead, no more testing. Moses is tested over and over again. David, Daniel, they're all, Jesus, they're tested over and over again. But you know, the beautiful thing is that at every moment of those tests, every major moment, there is revelation that comes in those things in those moments to those people. And if you're in that place where you feel like there's testing and trial and you feel alone, I'm going to tell you that you're not alone, that Jesus is with you. He's present. He is not only empathetic to your suffering, he can not only sympathize with your suffering, but he is present in your testing and your trial. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, out of the, the NLT, the New Living Translation, says this of Jesus, says this high priest, speaking of Jesus, of ours, understands our weaknesses. For he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. In your translation, in your Bible, if you've got an NRV, it won't have the word testings, it'll use the word tempted. So the translations are about half-half that I could see between tempting and testing. So I went and had a look at that word, and that word basically means the same thing. We we have a negative connotation to tempting. So we have, a, we have a thing of being tempted with sin. But that is a kind of testing. So that word is translated more often testing than it is tempting. But they use tempting here to convey the negative connotation of what the enemy tries to bring through that testing. That it is a temptation to shortcut what God has got for our lives. The word is, is often translated as scrutinized or examined. Jesus has been tested, he's been tempted, he's been scrutinized, he's been examined in every way, and yet he has remained faithful and without sin. He knows the trials you're facing. He understands our weaknesses. What a beautiful thing. Some of these trials that we go through, we think, God, I cannot take this anymore. Have you ever got to that point in a point of suffering where you're just going, Lord, I can't take it anymore. I am not strong enough for this. I thought I was when I started down this road but I didn't realize how many hills were on this run. Whatever it is, whatever that temptation is, and you get into it and you're like, testing is, Jesus understands our weaknesses, friends. And that's a beautiful thing. He can sympathize and empathize with you. He's been through all the trials and the testing and the temptation you will ever face. And he was without sin. He was, so let him lead you through those moments. The way that we walk through trials and testing is by following Jesus, by keeping our eyes fixed on him day in and day out. Because he's been through them but was without sin. So how do we we deal with this? What questions can we ask ourselves in times of testing? I've just got three questions that we can ask. And the first one is, how might you reframe the test? So often when the tests come, we see only the test and the trial. 
And we try and solve that thing because we want the comfort. But how much you reframe? So reframe is a word that's going around in modern lingo. It means to look at it differently, to understand the problem differently, to word it slightly the otherwise. So if you want to look at that and you go, how do you reframe the test that you are facing? So maybe the, maybe the test that you are facing is one of struggling with your weight and you struggle with being overweight and you eat too much. Maybe that's your testing. How do you reframe that? The easiest way to reframe that is to go, everybody matters. My body matters. And if I eat too much, I'm going to die earlier. I'm not picking on anybody here. There's a beautiful book called Everybody Matters. Don't see why you're laughing like that, bro. Het jy te veel geëerd van ochend? Het jy die conversation gehad vandag? But if we take any, any health, let's pick any health. There's a beautiful book called Everybody Matters. I'd encourage you to read it. But if you do that, you are going to shave 10, 15 years of your life, at least, probably more. But not now. You're going to shave years of your life that should be the best years of your life. When you are the furthest, the most mature in your spiritual walk, when your family is grown and you get to enjoy them as a grandparent or as a, an aunt or an uncle and you get to enjoy this, those are the years you're going to lose. And the enemy wants to steal some of the most productive years of your life from you with a fork. Reframe the testing. Re-see it. See it how it's. Same with smoking. Same with drugs. Same with whatever you want to, you want to destroy your body. I'm just using a health thing. You can look at how do you reframe the testing that you're going through. So that's the first thing that we, we ask in our times of testing. How do we reframe the test? The second question that we can ask is, what sounds of resurrection might you hear in the midst of your testing? What sounds of resurrection might you hear in the midst of your testing? And what that means is, in that time of testing, in that time of trial, start looking for the life that God is going to bring out of that thing. You know, when Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac, he focused on the fact that God would be able to raise Isaac up from the dead. He didn't, he didn't see the test as like, oh, this is going to be death, this is going to be the end. He sort of said, God has promised, this is the fulfillment of that promise, and God is going to be faithful to His promise, so God must be able to bring life out of this moment. What is, the, what is the whisperings of resurrection in the testing, in the trial that you are facing? Look for that. Look for the life of Jesus in this moment. How is God going to grow me through this? What new life is God going to grow in me through this thing, or in our family, or in my business, or in our community? What sounds of resurrection might you hear in the midst of testing? <clears throat> and then finally, who might be able to walk with you in this season to keep you grounded? And to keep you going forward. Who might be able to walk with you? Find a friend. Phone a friend, as they used to say on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. Get somebody to help you. It is far easier to face times of testing when you are with somebody. I love running on my own. I thoroughly enjoy it. It's time for me. I get my head out. I don't have to talk to anybody. I, I, and if you've been up and down the road, you've seen me running up and down the road. But I, I enjoy doing it on my own. But I noticed something when I was running a marathon the other day in Belito, and I was really in a very difficult place. I had hit the wall, and my legs had decided they didn't want to run anymore. And my brain was trying to tell them to go, but they weren't listening. And there were three occasions when three, two or three people came past. You could see, same running vest, same club. And they were chatting, and they were talking, and they were like having, I mean, some of the conversation was, but they had someone to go with them. And I just, in that moment, I was like, yes, I wish I'd actually run this marathon with somebody. I wish I'd actually run with somebody in this thing, because now it would be far easier to have them go, come on, keep going, pick it up, or let's stop and stretch, or have you eaten, or have you, because like, everything went pear-shaped. I forgot to eat, and I wasn't drinking properly, and it made it compound, it made it worse. But who might you be able to walk with in this season? Pick somebody, and it doesn't have to be somebody who's been through that trial. It doesn't have to be somebody who's like experienced 20, 40 other things. It's just someone who's going to faithfully walk with you in that moment. Somebody who's going to walk with you through that testing and that trial. 
Somebody who can be there for you. So those three things. How do you reframe it? What sounds of resurrection might you hear? And who might you be able to walk with in those things? Don't walk it alone. Don't face trials and testings alone. You might think you can tough it out. But I promise you it's far easier with someone there by your side. Walk with people. If any of you have been through or you know anything about the recovery programs that are where any kind of addiction or recovery program, the reason they put you with a sponsor is because you need someone to walk with you through that thing. Someone who you can phone and go, hey, I'm struggling. Hey, I can't see the outcome of this thing. I don't know why I'm doing this. I've lost sight of why I'm here. Come on, we're going to go. We're going to go another day. Do you remember how bad it was? Look how far you've come. You can still do this thing. You've done it already. Let's keep going. Walk with someone who's there to be able to be there with you. Jesus has more for you than you could ever dream or imagine. Do not let times of testing and trial distract you from keeping your eyes fixed on him. Don't see them as something that is wrong. See them rather as opportunities to grow into who God has made you to be, to live that unrepeatable life that God has for you. Amen. Father, I thank you that you are so good. I thank you that even though sometimes it feels like the testing and the trials are too much, Lord, that you are with us, that you care for us, and that you walk with us. Jesus, I pray that you would help us to keep our eyes fixed on you, that you would help us to keep our eyes off the problems, off the testing, off the testing, off the trials, and keep our eyes fixed on you, God. Keep our eyes fixed on where you are leading us. God, in those moments, I pray that you would remind us of the promises that you have given us, that you have spoken over us before that, Lord, that we wouldn't lose sight of who we are in you, Jesus. Father, I pray that, Holy, that you would send your Holy Spirit to remind us of your word that speaks life into us. Remind us of passages that we've read. Remind us of truths that are in your Bible, Lord God. Timeless truths that we can hold on to. In a world that so eagerly seeks comfort, Lord, let us not be those who are blown around by every wind of testing and trouble, Lord. I thank you that we get to do this life with you, Jesus. We get to be a part of what you are doing. We get to be a part of your kingdom. And I pray that as we advance your kingdom, that you would grow us and mature us through times of testing and trial. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.